So as I said the other night at Puja, there has um, been war since beginningless time because there has been ignorance, attachment, anger since beginningless time. So rather than talk about war, are you tired of hearing about war? I thought today we'd talk about one of the antidotes, one of the main antidotes, and that's about developing bodhicitta. Uh, to develop bodhicitta, we need to develop great compassion in our minds. And to develop great compassion, we first of all need equanimity, uh, because otherwise our compassion will be biased. And uh, by developing equanimity, then we free our minds from manifest, ideally, we're aiming to free our minds from manifest afflictions of attachment and and uh, ignorance. So today I'd like to share some of my experiences of meditating on equanimity during uh, this retreat. Um, to create some context, after my dad died in 2013, um, at the prayer service the night before his funeral, my sister's friend put together a slideshow, and that's pretty common these days at funerals. And what amazed me by sitting and watching the slideshow was that I saw my dad as a three-year-old playing with a truck in the dirt. And I saw my dad as a 12-year-old with his bicycle, which he rode to school every day. Uh, I saw my dad in his cap and gown graduating from high school and uh, in his uh, service uniform. He was in the Army. Luckily, he knew how to type, so he got a desk job in Washington, D.C. Uh, I saw my dad um, standing at the beach with his new wife on his honeymoon. And then I saw my dad as a new father with his first daughter, my sister. Um, and on and on throughout his life, all these different snapshots of different moments of his, of his life. And so what struck me in that moment being hard open because of the grief of losing my dad was um, realizing that I didn't really know my dad as a person. I knew him as my dad. Uh, so that was interesting to, to take in. And then the other thing that hit me was there was really no dad. There were just these individual moments of mind of dad, or what I labeled dad. And so that had a very strong impact on me. I'd never taken that in in quite the same way. Um, so I'm bringing, I brought that into my meditations on equanimity. Geshe Tabke was teaching on equanimity in January as a precursor for developing uh, compassion and bodhicitta. And he was really encouraging us to take this, not just on the cushion, but take it into our lives so that it informed every moment of our life. And so I took that as a, a personal instruction, and I decided, yeah, I've, I've heard this before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I aspired to do it. Um, when I lived in Australia, Geshe Tashi Seren gave us the homework. I've mentioned this. He gave us the homework to meditate on equanimity for an hour every day for a year. And at the time, I thought, how boring. What would you think about um, for that entire hour? And so I attempted to do it for a half an hour for a period of time, and I found it very fruitful. Um, the equanimity meditation has been quite an important meditation uh, for me in my development uh, for the express purpose of showing me how involved my own mind is in how I see the world. Um, but then taking it to the next step of using it to really even out the playing field when we develop these other states of mind like love and compassion and the highest resolve. So Kamala Sheila's text gives us two lines of inquiry, really. The first one is from the point of view of other, and that is that all sentient beings want happiness and want to be free of suffering. And that's pretty straightforward, I think. I mean, it takes a lot of familiarization with, but I think it's pretty straightforward. The second one is that is from our own point of view, seeing that every sentient being has played the role of a friend and even stranger countless times. And that one's a little bit harder to uh, really develop conviction in because we can't see past and future lives. And then a third point, and I'm not sure where this came from, maybe from Venerable, is that our full awakening depends on others, every other. If we leave any other out, we cannot develop equanimity, we cannot develop love, compassion, bodhicitta. So these were the three points that I was working with in this meditation. Um, so just, again, a little more context. Kamala Shila was an 8th century Indian scholar. And so if you look at his text, it's pretty terse. It's like Jeffrey was saying today, it was like a telegram. It was very terse. It didn't fill in all the blanks. So it seemed like it went from equanimity to great compassion, 
without a lot of the steps that we're probably more familiar with, with the seven-point uh, cause and effect instruction on developing bodhicitta. And then by the 11th century, Lama Atish is the one, well, I don't know if he devised this sevenfold instruction or someone before him, but he's the one who spelled it out. And then Lama Sankapa carried on from, from that tradition in the Lama Rinchima, where we have equanimity and then the sevenfold instructions. So um, all of these, uh, well, particularly this, this meditation on seeing all sentient beings have played all different roles for us is based on the point that we find in the middle scope of the long rim, the uncertainty of our relationship with others. Uh, again, of such an important thing to reflect on. And even beginning just with this life, I've spent a number of sessions just thinking about how friends, enemies, and strangers have completely changed. Um, I was surprised, again, just how long I could spend thinking about that. <laughs> um, so in each session, I would try to bring to mind different uh, neutral person, a different friend, a different enemy. And, you know, I had my standards that I would go back to, like the, the, the typical standard for me is Wendy at the post office. How many of you know Wendy? I've thought about her so much that she's now a friend. I can't think of her as a neutral person anymore. Or Lana at the chiropractor office, um, et cetera. So each session I would really have to work to think about, well, who actually do I feel like is a, a neutral person? Who, who do I feel indifferent towards? So I found myself thinking about our neighbors like Frank and Leslie. I know who they are. I don't know much about them. I'm pretty indifferent towards them. So I, I really enjoyed thinking about them. I thought about the people who used to fix our chainsaws. I don't remember their names, but we visited them in uh, Priest River. And uh, different people, the UPS guy, the mail lady. It was fun to think about, you know, really focusing in on seeing individual people as neutral people and then cha challenging that appearance. And then friends, it was easy to think of, but I really had to train my mind, discipline my mind, not to get it all involved in stories and memories and going into reminiscing. And then uh, luckily I found with enemies, there aren't too many in that category anymore, although there were a few people that I called to mind um, a number of times uh, just because uh, of certain things that were going uh, around along. So um, they say that realizing each person has been our mother is one of the most difficult topics in the Lam Rim. That and recognizing your teacher as a Buddha. <laughs> Those are the two most difficult points. So to get some feeling that each person had been a friend, an enemy, and a stranger, no matter how I labeled them, I would start with a stranger. Let's say Frank, just as an example. And I would do a kind of regression in my mind. So I would think of Frank as he is now, or at least how I, my generic image of Frank. And then I'm guessing he's about 60. So I I would try to think about, well, what was he like when he was 50? And I'd really try to imagine into that, you know, what was he like 10 years before? And what was he like at 40? You know, had a lot more energy, maybe his kids were growing up. What was he like at 30? What kind of work was he doing? What was he interested in? What was he like as a 20-year-old, you know, fresh out of, maybe involved in college or trade school or newly getting married, just trying to imagine what that was like? What was he like coming out of high school? You know, maybe he was a jock. Maybe he was <laughs> playing sports or dating, getting involved in dating. What was, what was he interested in? What kind of family life did he have? What was he like as a 10-year-old? That was really helpful to get into seeing someone in the early years of their life. What was he like as a 2- or 3-year-old running around his house? What was he like as a baby in his mother's arms? Maybe even imagining him nursing. And then what was he like in the womb? You know, I'm really thinking about that progression or regression in the womb all the way back to the moment of conception. And I found this had a very powerful effect on my mind to break down the way I, my mind naturally wants to see someone as an autonomous, unique personality. Um, and then when I got to the point, point of conception, of course, I, I could think about how, and then in their previous life, I could also go, th go through another progression. But instead of that, I would imagine I had supernormal powers, and then I could see all their past lives. And so then all those past lives, then I could imagine that in most of those past lives, we were complete strangers. We had nothing to do with each other. We were born in different realms. Or if we were on the same planet, we were born on different continents. Or even in the same, on the same continent, we were on opposite ends of the continent. Or even if we were in, born in the same area, living in the same area, uh, probably the, it was possible that we would never have known each other. 
And even if we lived in the same area, we could pass each other on the street and not really recognize each other, not even acknowledge each other. So again, very interesting to think about that. And then I would try to imagine Frank, as an example, um, ha and not just Frank, as I know Frank, but Frank the mere eye that's labeled on Frank, thinking about Frank as playing the role of my mother. And you know the relationships that we have in this life then influence how we think about that. And it would bring a softness, a kind of tenderness to how I would think about Frank. <laughs> Having played the role of my mother and my father, my sister, my brother, uh, my child, my husband, my wife, my friend, my dear friend in the past. Um, so taking time to go through these imaginations in my mind. First as humans, and then I'd also try to imagine, and, and not just once, you know, I've been my mother many times uh, when we were, um, when we had white skin and black skin and brown skin and yellow skin, you know, it just goes on and on. This is why I really had to rein myself in after a half hour because I could just keep going. Um, and then thinking about all the lives that we might have had as animals. And uh, they say even hungry ghosts have, some hungry ghosts have uh, mothers, so thinking about some of those lives as well. Um, then I would think about possibilities of having been Frank's enemy. You know, imagining, given the war scenario that we're living in, that we had been on opposing sides of battlefields in the past, or maybe involved in uh, different feuds, family feuds or tribal feuds, or um, being involved in relationship difficulties, or um, even as animals, territorial uh, fights. Just trying to imagine into that, how, how might that have manifested. So then I went through the same process with someone I identified as a friend, someone I identified uh, as an enemy, and by the time I finished, they all felt quite similar. It was quite interesting to notice that. It does work <laughs> if we do it. <laughs> After a while, I, um, I was running out of strangers, and so I, I started uh, including people who I saw in news clips. Uh, there are so many news clips right now. How many of you are turning into doom scrollers? Um, so I would imagine different people, but I noticed that if I saw someone acting kindly, like I saw this one clip of a news reporter who uh, was reporting on a, a bridge that had, had been blown up in Ukraine, to prevent um, Russian troops from going across, but the people trying to escape in a corridor there had to traverse this broken bridge area. And this reporter at one point was so moved by the people going across this area that she, you saw her, she stepped aside to help an older woman carry a bag and get up this little bit of a hill. I couldn't see her as a stranger, even though I had no information about her, no connection with her. Because of her kindness, I couldn't see her as a stranger. And the same thing was true with people I identified as strong enemies. Even if I didn't have any content about them, it was difficult to be completely indifferent to them and see them as a stranger. So that was interesting to notice. Um, along the way, I discovered some old attachments with friends um, that in this process gave me an opportunity to reflect on that, to analyze that, and to update some of those old attachments. The same is true with old resentments. I had a chance to revisit those and let go of, of many of those. Um, and I, I hope this is okay to say, for uh, just a short period of the retreat, whenever I saw someone, when I would come out of the session and come in here, whenever I saw someone, this regression would start going in my mind. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Of course, it vanished as soon as I stop doing full retreat, but it gave me a little glimpse of just how powerful this kind of familiarization is with our mind. And I think that's why His Holiness can say, wherever I go, I see people as my friends, as part of my family, because he's so conditioned to this kind of meditation. Um, so this is definitely a meditation worth spending time on. And um, I would say that this has been one of the most powerful retreats that I've ever um, engaged in, probably for many reasons. Um, but also, as a result of this retreat, I also feel like I am more of a beginner than I have ever been. And I hope that's a good sign. <laughs> um, so I think it's much more productive to meditate on uh, equanimity and bodhicitta than, than doing the doom scrolling to see the, the, the newest atrocity that's posted all over the internet. Um, and our precious human life is quickly coming to an end. So Let's use it wisely. <laughs>